I want you to start thinking like a visionary who has no limits, who has infinite potential. And the first role of leadership is what? How do I lead self, which ultimately will determine your power to influence others. What is a leader? A leader is an example. So one of the things that you need to fucking wrap your head around is in order for you to fulfill a massive vision, you have to fulfill massive shoes. Okay, and some of you may be going, well, I don't have the skills, I don't have the experience, I may not have the knowledge, and I'm telling you, you have what you have right now to get you to the next step. There are seven things that I've seen the greatest visionary leaders of all time do. So the first thing that I see visionary leaders do, they see, they see the future that is different from the current reality, but they don't resist the moment. Some people, if they go, I see this future different from what it is right now, and I can't stand the way it is in this moment. Now, that energy that you're spending on fighting the moment, guess where do you think it would be best directed? Into execution. The reason they don't resist the moment, two reasons. Number one, visionary leaders understand that everything in front of them right now is, by their, is there by virtue and design of the vision. And it is present by virtue and design to give you whatever is required for the fulfillment of that different future reality. And the more time you spend fighting that current moment, the less chance and less time you have when it comes to building that future reality. You can't be at war with the moment whilst focusing on a vision for the future. And as a result, when we resist the moment, what do we actually create? Suffering. See, your life is great, but maybe your perspective isn't. But there is a gap between where you are now and where you need to be. Do you know what that chasm, do you know what's in that chasm? Lack. A lack of skill, a lack of knowledge, and a lack of experience. So the moment you lock on to a future vision that you're inspired by at a soul level, immediately the forces around you will conspire to help you achieve that. But oftentimes what they present you doesn't look like a doorway, it looks like a pile of shit. And you sit there and go, oh my God, this is not what I ordered. And when you have this, oh my God, this is not what I ordered, this resistance to the moment, you're playing a human game. Because when you play the big game, you don't look at the moment, you look at the vision. And you have faith that everything is going to work out as it is. And the more you resist it, the more you prevent the transfer of the skill, the transfer of the knowledge, the transfer of the experience. The second thing visionary leaders see is they see talent as the key to unlock. They realize that no one man can change the world. No one woman can change the world. They realize in order to fulfill their destiny at the highest level, they have to learn how to collaborate they will see that in order for their future reality that they see differently to come to fruition, they're going to need help. How do you enroll others to fulfill your vision? Well, first of all, don't make your vision about you. Make your vision about something so big that it inspires and it has an ability to reach out and grab other people as well. Because I can tell you right now, no amount of talent that you acquire will ever be motivated to make you rich. They're simply not. Talent are motivated to express their potential, but they want to do it in an environment that actually supports that expression of potential. They want to do it in an environment where their potential is nurtured. They want to do it in an environment where they feel safe. They want to do it in an environment where they get the opportunities to learn. They want to do it in an environment where they have autonomous responsibility, They're not treated like little fucking children. And they've got the ability to make their own decisions, make their own plays. Everybody at the highest level of leadership understands the importance of talent and the importance of nurturing that talent. The third thing, they see business as a vehicle that is adaptable and agile. Has anyone here ever started a business doing one thing and then you realized it wasn't the very thing that you wanted to do so you had to make a slight pivot? Has anyone ever started something before and you felt so confined it didn't, it didn't feel like it was going in the direction you wanted, but you were like, well, I've already started it, so I, I have to keep going. And you stayed there and you were fucking miserable. Once upon a time, they say, change is inevitable. We have to be agile. We have to be able to learn to adapt. But that was in environments where change and transitioning was happening over, a, in some cases, a three to five year period. Now, we're seeing massive disruption happening in, in some cases in a matter of months, where a new piece of technology comes out 
and industries are being completely rattled to their core. What we need to start doing as a visionary leaders with these huge visions is understand that whenever you know, we have a moment that comes to us, okay, that is different from what we expect, we literally have to maintain the perspective of it's not the end, it's just an adaptation. Your job as a visionary leader is to be thinking contingency. What is contingency? What is a contingency plan? It's a backup plan. It's an alternative option. And so what we need to start understanding as visionary leaders, yes, we need to be adaptable. Yes, we need to be agile. But how do we maximize agility? How do we maximize adaptability? By being prepared. By having contingencies. By thinking ahead. And every single one of you should be thinking ahead right now in different areas of your business. In your industry, in the areas of market, in the areas of competitor, okay, in the areas of distribution, because I guarantee you, that's what's going to happen. Whether that be at an economic level or at a technological level, what do you think people are going to say? Oh, I wish I had prepared. Oh, I wish I had a contingency. Oh, I remember fucking Keon saying something about that. The future of customers is not in databases. The future of customers are communities. Communities that connect people with shared values. So that's where, in order for us to be visionary leaders at the highest level, what do we need to be clear on? What are our values? What are your fucking values? It's also about understanding what else? Your market values. And then asking yourself the question, do they align? Does the market values and my commercial values align? And if not, does something have to change? Five, they see problems, failures, setbacks as a form of feedback required to learn, grow, and build resilience and grit. So if someone fails, ah, oh, why are you pissed off? Well, I failed. Yeah, but what did you learn? Well, I learned this, this, and this. What skill did you get? Oh, I got this. What experience? I got that. Why are you pissed off at that? You should be fucking excited. How conscious are you of your failure relationship? For some of you, big failures might take three weeks to reconcile. For some of you, a week to reconcile. For some of you, a day. But my question is, why can't it be a moment? Imagine a world where as things start to fall down, the moment they start to fall down, your first response isn't, Oh no, it's, wow, isn't that interesting? What am I learning from this right now? What skills, knowledge, experience am I gaining from this right now? And like some of your ass is puckering so high right now. Like, fuck, I can't. Yes, you can. You can do that when you relinquish the desire to be biased. The universe, nature, has no bias. It just exists as it is because it understands everything that is, is perfect. And every failure, every fuck up, every form of destruction, chaos, but also beauty is there by design to give you what you need. But my question to you is, how much suffering do you entertain? If you are biased towards your problems, you will fucking suffer. If you are neutral towards your problems, you'll be fucking curious as hell. Number six, they see the power of proximity in herds as an intimate relationships. Because when we talk about proximity, I'm talking herds at large but also intimate relationships. Because what we understand about proximity is who you surround yourself with will determine your vibration. How regularly are you auditing your network? If you're not putting yourself around the right people, you're not gonna produce the right results. Some of us might need to have a diet on some of our relationships. It doesn't mean that you have to stop seeing people, it just means maybe you restrict the calories of time that you actually consume with them. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you understand what is important. And what is important? Well, that comes down to you, doesn't it? Purpose, mission. And I have actually, I would say, seen, lost some incredible clients to unfortunate social and intimate dynamics, whereby individuals will surrender their vision, they'll surrender their dreams, they'll surrender and subjugate their values in order to appease other people, family, intimate others. And as a result, they live a life that is what? Filled with regret and empty space. Number seven, last but not least, they see themselves as the one responsible for their future and all that it brings. Because it's not until you can own every creation in your space, every expression of energy in your space, that you can fully step into and awaken your power. If blame exists in any area of your life, you are playing a disempowered game. When extreme ownership is present, blame cannot exist. Everything is my fault. And if it's not my fault, then it's my responsibility. What is ownership? 
It's mine. I did it. I created it. I'm responsible for it. What is responsibility? Your ability to respond. Because I've had situations before where things keep coming up. Same thing, oh, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I'm like, what are you doing about it? Because you're clearly making the same mistake over and over. Where's the responsibility? And again, most people get confused and say, well, I'm owning it, it's mine. I say, no, 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 you're misunderstanding my statement, my question. My question is, you're responding the same way every time you make this mistake. So something's wrong with your ability to respond. Your response ability isn't, hasn't kicked in yet. When it comes to any event in your life, step one is ownership. Step two is responsibility. And it's a lot easier to be responsible when you plan and when you think contingent, when you think contingency. So the seven things, seeing the future differently than current reality, but they don't resist the moment. They see talent as a key to unlock the future of scale, duplication, leverage. They see business as an adaptable, agile expression of their purpose and provides value. They see the future of customers isn't in databases, but communities that connect people with shared values. They see problems, failures, and setbacks as a form of feedback required to grow and build resilience and grit. They see the power of proximity in herds, masterminds, and intimate relationships. And they see themselves as the one response able for their future and all that it brings, extreme ownership. This, to me, is powerful knowledge. These qualities at a high level, as a visionary leader, will come down to what? How much do you love the process? How much do you actually love the process of leading? I want to empower you with the knowledge, but I can't empower you with the experience. Experience will only come through the practice of going through the motions.